And I'm back in Alberta, buddy. Back on Welcome. your time zone. That's going to make things hey. so much easier for scheduling interviews. Won't it? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Just, uh, I got a, I got a new renter in my house in Halifax. So that stress is gone. That's yep. beautiful. But yeah, three hour difference. And then trying to also coordinate it with all the, uh, spring training boys in Eastern time. So I'm like, okay, it's 10 o'clock your time. One o'clock my time <laughs> noon for them. Yeah. <laughs> Too much bad. math here. We had uh, a <laughs> bit of a rodeo trying to coordinate with Kloffenstein. That's for sure. We had to reschedule on a couple it of was. occasions for that very reason, I think. For that very reason. But uh, it is awesome. We did wind up talking to Adam Kloffenstein. He was just a joy to chat with last Friday. Uh, His interview is up in full on our YouTube page right now. You can uh, subscribe to our channel so you're not missing any of these prospect interviews we're doing throughout our spring training extravaganza here on the walk-off. We're releasing, we talked to Nick Algeyer, big lefty. That should be probably pitching in double A is my guess this year for the Jays, but he's at big league camp right now. So we're going to release that on Wednesday on YouTube. And then of course uh, we're going to be pairing it with the podcast uh, probably a few weeks down the road. If you're just, if you're one of those audio listeners, we love you all. So Um, we'll do CJ Van Eyck today. That's who we're going to be airing the interview of really, really, um, What's the right word here? He was such a fun guy to talk to because he was so out of his element, right? It's his first spring training. He got a big league. He got the call to big league spring training and he'd never played pro ball before straight from college to that. So like him talking about the Dunedin facility and just meeting all the guys, he seemed like a star struck kid. It was was awesome. So, yeah. So we'll get to that in probably about 25 yeah. minutes. He's, uh, it was cool. He's another tie to a uh, friend of the podcast, Anthony Telford. Yeah, that's right. We brought up Telford. You should see the kid's face. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. Check out the video. He really was just like, because I, I, I summed it up like, hey, CJ, we have like a one degree separation here. We actually know someone in common. And he was just like so he confused, almost, right? He Texas looked, boy, our Florida boy. He's just like, he what are you talking about? He looked kind of concerned at first, like, <laughs> Like, yeah, right. In the headlights, like, uh oh, I hope this is a good connection. <laughs> yeah. If this if this guy says he's my yeah. dad, I'm out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, and buddy, baseball's oh. back. I mean, we can just say it now. It's, it's a, a yeah. beautiful thing. We got to watch baseball oh, yesterday afternoon, you know, seven man. Solid innings. All is right with the world. <laughs> and obviously, there is zero sense in taking anything away from yesterday's first spring training game but it was so much fun to watch and one thing about this jays lineup that just kept coming to mind was this batting order is going to be Mm -hmm. relentless like even yesterday the first spring training game of the year And it was Biggio leading off, Marcus Simeon, Lourdes Gurriel, or sorry, it was Bichette, Gurriel, Vladdy, Rowdy. And we didn't even have Springer in the lineup. There was no Springer. There was no Teo. You know, there was no uh, Grishik. It was, uh, anyways, it was just so much fun to watch. Anthony Kay looked really good. Hitting 97. The guy is uh, putting some velocity on. We've got a lot of good left-handers in this system, man. It's very exciting. Um, Joey Murray. Friend of the show. Joey Let's talk Murray. Joey Murray yes. for a second. He got an inning yesterday. It was so cool to watch him go three up, three down. It was kind of surreal, eh, to watch a guy that yeah, we talked to on that the show giddy. in a Blue Jays uni. It was the awesome. The fanboy in me went just nuts. I was watching with my wife and my daughter, and I was like, "Oh, I'm like, we talked to this guy. This is this is our boy." So, yeah, same same with me. Yeah, the same thing. I had the wife with me, and she was the same. She was like, "Oh my god, I can't." Same with Groshans. Like when Groshans went to the place, she's like, "Oh my god, you talked to him." I was <laughs> yeah. like, "Yeah, it's pretty, pretty cool, cool, kind of a big deal." <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it was really exciting. It was really cool to watch too, because the the broadcast had the Yankees play by play, right? So it's cool watching mm-hmm. uh, commentators for another organization also be excited about Joey Murray's stupid spin rate. Yeah. Invisible. So yeah, I don't know. It's just it's always it's like a confirmation that like okay we're not just like home team bias when you get excited about something like that when 
a neutral third party also agrees like hey there's something special about this kid a little validation that we weren't just kind of excited Mm -hmm. because we talked to him absolutely yeah and joey murray is a guy too that you know he is a little bit older than some of these higher ranked pitching prospects you know than guys like Cloffenstein and cj van eyck you know these are guys that yeah, like these are guys that are 2021. 20, Joey Murray's 24, a little bit more uh, life experience mm-hmm. behind him, you know? And he's a guy that was lower down in the rankings. So he had to, I, I, I think work harder is the wrong way to frame this, but he had to take a little bit of a tougher mental route mm-hmm. to get there. You know, like no one was, no one was pushing Joey Murray when he first was drafted by the mm-hmm. Blue Jays in the eighth round. They were like, if this kid works out, great. If not, well, there's another eighth round. The definition of a lottery out, so. ticket in sports, right? Exactly. Exactly. So it's kind of cool to see uh, him is succeeding like he is. And that full interview is also – and that's the thing with this interview with Joey Murray is it's fantastic. He gets so into uh, his life behind yeah. baseball, you know, his first experience going to Rogers Center for the alternate – or, and then Rochester for the mm-hmm. alternate spring training. And he probably doesn't have enough love on there because that was, we're doing much better as a mm-hmm. podcast. We're getting so many more listeners and right, viewers right. now. You know, when he, he stopped was our back first Blue two Jays months prospect. ago, he was our first Blue Jays prospect. Kind of started yeah. that ball rolling. So go check well, it out, uh, everybody. We'll link to that video um, in the end of this one as well. So, yeah, great idea. Great idea. Listen. Let's, uh, we do have a few things to chat about here. I did wish to get into the culture of this team. And I'm well aware that when people talk culture, it's just easy to tune out because it's such a, (laughs) it's such a buzz phrase in the sports world. Oh, Mm -hmm. the culture, the clubhouse culture. It's, it makes or breaks. And is it that big of a deal? But it was really interesting. And you might have got the same thing because you listened to all these Mm -hmm. these interviews while they were going on. You you were listening while these guys were kind of feeding their Mm -hmm. baseball knowledge out to the world. There is something special going on in that Blue Jays organization, man. And I, I, I know I'm probably a homer, but I can really feel it. Like these kids are Mm -hmm. dialed in. These are 20-year-old kids. So I've got a list of things to go through here. But the one thing I do wish to touch on before we get too into it is they are dedicated to this game on a level that is far surpassing where these prospects used to be, let's say, Mm -hmm. even 20 years ago. Let's talk about even the interviews we did with C.J. Van Eyck, Adam Kloffenstein, and Nick Elgeyer. When were they? Uh, Friday Friday nights. nights. Yeah. All three of them were on Friday nights. These kids weren't out looking for mm-hmm. a party. These kids weren't out looking for girls. They could be. But you know what they're doing on their spare time? Talking baseball. With baseball nerds. With yeah. podcasts. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. And and even when they were talking about the the system, every single guy we chatted with, Every single one of them, Al Geyer, Kloffenstein, Van Eyck, all of them have mentioned how supportive and calming the major league players have been in this spring training. And you go back even 10 years, and that was not the case, right? It was haze mm-hmm. the rookies, make them feel small, make them earn their place. You don't get to talk mm-hmm. to the big leaguers until you have earned your spot for two, three years. And let's not kid ourselves. There's no way that doesn't hinder mm-hmm. development. Of course it does. So all of a sudden, these 20-year-old kids, guys like Kloffenstein, are able to sit down and chat with Hin mm-hmm. Jin Ryu. Ryu, like, well, this is one ex- thing that Kloff was talking translator, about. And his translator, maybe not the best example. And his translator. <laughs> yeah, and his translator. It's not the best example. But he was yeah, talking he about talking to Ryu and getting grips off him and stuff like that, you know? Just that even the fact that a guy like Nick Elgeyer, like, they were all talking about how they're all broken into mm-hmm. small groups to help limit the mm-hmm. spread, right? I mean... We are still in a pandemic. But he was talking about that he was in the same group, right, pitching live batting practice to Mm -hmm. George Springer. 
And this is this is a guy that's going to be in double A, and George is sitting there and and talking about mm-hmm. his stuff with him and ta- telling him what he's throwing mm-hmm. well and what he's not. And you know, this is not across the board in every organization. This is not necessarily how every baseball organization works. And it's just really cool to kind of see that, even when you see and hear stuff about Marcus Simeon and Boba Shett being attached mm-hmm. at the hip in this spring training because they're trying to develop a chemistry between the two in that middle infield, right? It's the first time that Simeon has played second base for any, uh, mm-hmm. for any real amount of time, right? I think it's, I think the last time he played second base was right. back in college. Like, <laughs> right, right. like he's played second base on a, like, well, we have a weird matchup this week or somebody's injured. Exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that's really cool. And the other thing that kind of stood out to me, man, is that when you watched them play yesterday Mm -hmm. afternoon, just how much fun Mm -hmm. all of them were having and how much support all of them Mm -hmm. were giving each other. And again, there's lots Mm -hmm. of teams like that. It's not necessarily an outlier, but you know what it is. It's something that they don't need to worry Mm -hmm. about down the road. You know, culture can kill an Mm -hmm. organization, and it can also just not be a problem. And it's not a problem on this team, and I think that's great. I don't know how you feel about no, it. No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, we don't have any big egos that are walking around like their shit don't stink, even though some of them might not. Um, I yeah. think it's it's a that's, a... that's a great point with the ego. Even George Springer, you probably even heard this quote where he was like, it is not up to me, or it's not up to the team to integrate me into... Mm-hmm. The clubhouse it is for me to sit back watch and see where i fit mm-hmm. in with everyone that's our 150 million dollar man saying that you know last year nobody expected us to win the world series last year that was not not practical in any sense of the word we were considering last season a win if we made the playoffs and our young core you know, learned how to compete, right? Which we did. We absolutely yes. achie- achieved our goals. Moving into this year, I was, I mean, going into the off season, kind of thinking the same. Like, let's just learn how to compete on a full 162 game scale, right? Like, let's, how do you grind it out when you're having a losing streak? You know, how do you not pack it in when you're going through those tough times, right? But man, the culture has taken a, again, culture, stupid word, but there it is, has taken a huge step forward. And I think we've heard it even just talking with guys like Kloffenstein, who's been saying, you know, there is more talent than there is spots available. And it's pushing everybody, right? Like there is a electric energy at spring training right now. There is, management has set the tone by signing Springer. Getting Simeon, yeah, right. Is that we're we're going for it? So everybody yeah. that's at spring training is like just I don't know. They got a like a cool energy about it. Like it's just it's unreal. There's such a dynamic, youthful group too that have come up together, and I think there's a lot to be said for that core of Guriel, Vladdy, Bichette. Yeah. Biggio that have literally played together for right. five years, which is insane because they're all 21, right. 22, you know, I mean, Biggio's 26, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they're all very young. No, so, it's really cool. I think, and maybe that's even the conditioning, like, man, when you look at these guys, like mm-hmm. Bichette yeah. is ripped. I know you <laughs> wouldn't guess like, that to like, look at them, but um, no, no. And you know what? Kloffenstein touched on this too with the the age of the pro ball club making it more approachable um is it's not a team that's you know it's not all eight-year MLB vets right these are guys that Mm -hmm. were in the minors two years ago right so they're a little little less crazy from you know being relatable and approachable so I, I don't know it's really cool yeah uh we sure do have a couple log jams at a few positions though with young talent who's pushing our big league club. And that's great yeah. to see. So, I mean, that it is great to see going to get, get to make it. And some people are going to have to get moved, but it's a great problem to have. So it's interesting to me to watch that catching position 
and see how much talent is backlogged mm -hmm. at that position, it is really pretty mind blowing when you start to take a look at that because El Alejandro mm -hmm. Kirk, Captain Kirk, he is pushing Reese McGuire. The, the position is Kirk's to lose is pretty much how I think this goes. I mean, obviously, the Blue Jays are lacking lefty bats. I think McGuire would need to light the spring on fire for them to consider sending Kirk to AAA. You think Kirk starts on the big league club? I think he does. I, I don't know, though. What do you think? Maybe there is some more development that could be done in AAA I don't know, man. I don't know. I, I'm i not a Reese McGuire fan. Me neither. So I'd be... He's jacked off in one too many parking <laughs> lots for my liking. <laughs> you went there. Low-hanging fruit. There. Come oh on. God. Grow up, Scott. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I think... I think we've seen enough from... Honestly, I'm not a big fan of Danny Jansen either, so... There, I'm putting it out there. Yeah. I mean, he needs to start. We can't have him hit 180. That is not major league well, acceptable. And he's not a smart enough old vet of a catcher who can make up for a, a 200 yes. batting average with, yeah, but he sure calls a great game. And, you know, his defensive wiliness the rotation isn't, isn't. or anything like that. Like we can't mm -hmm. know if it was Russell Martin hitting 200. Sure. But agreed. Speaking of Russell Martin talk. I know we were just talking about this dynamic of this, this young team here, but talk about how different this competitive team is from 2015. You know, like you were talking about, how a lot of these guys on the Jays team right now were in the minors two years ago. But you look at that contender in 2015, most of those guys weren't in the minors. It was, you had to go 10, 15 years back to get the, to the point where they were in the minors. Well, like, and this, this team is a lot of homegrown talent. I mean, other than George Springer, obviously, and Marcus Simeon, who's really just a, mm -hmm. a band aid this year, signing the one year contract. Right. But, you know, it's not like 2015 where we're bringing in Tulowitzki and we're bringing in um, David Price or anything like that, right? Like, Yeah, so agreed. And I, I think this Simeon deal, in true Blue Jays fan fashion, is going to be hilarious to watch unfold. Because there were a lot of Blue Jays fans that when they signed him, they were like, why are you paying $18 million for an infielder that we don't necessarily need when we need pitching so mm -hmm. badly right and then you watch Simeon is going to light the world on fire that is my prediction I think that he is going to be one of the top hitters in this lineup I think that Simeon is going to solidify the defense in this infield I think that his experience is going to help Bichette more than we can even put Absolutely. into words and I I think come September every Jays fan is going to be screaming for us to sign him. And I don't think they're going to. And why aren't they going to? Because guess what? Jordan Groshans and Austin mm -hmm. Martin are mm -hmm. close. And they're closer than people are giving them credit for. Even last night, or yesterday afternoon, I should say, Groshans was getting reps at shortstop, mm -hmm. which I love seeing, right? Like, he's projected to be their mm -hmm. third baseman. Austin Martin is projected to be third or center field. Both of them are natural shortstops. Both of them are still getting reps mm -hmm. at shortstop which is such a Blue Jays mm -hmm. move, right? Let's keep yeah. them versatile. Let's make it so they can play Absolutely. two or three positions. But that's fantastic. Yeah. You know, like, and this is another thing. Looking down the road, if Simeon goes, which he probably mm -hmm. is going to again, that allows, if they'd like, Biggio to go to mm -hmm. third. You know, you can move, maybe you can move Groshans to second. There's so many options mm -hmm. you can do here. But I can't wait for all of these naysayers of Marcus Simeon to be screaming from the rooftops in September that we need to sign him long-term and then be screaming at them <sighs> when they don't. <laughs> I, You know what? 10 out of 10, I hope you're right. I hope he has a phenomenal yeah. season where everybody wants him back, and I also hope he doesn't come back. Yeah. But only because we, we have a replacement but, in, like the, who deserves a spot. You know, if... Yeah. If we sign him long term, it's because something else didn't work out somewhere else, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. Groshans had a really bad 
minor league season or, you know, something like that has to happen for us to bring yeah. Simeon back. Or, you know, like a, an ugly, knock on wood, uh, an ugly injury to uh i'm not even going to say names because if it yeah happens, i mean you I'm, can't I'm you can't for it. yeah you can't tell you can't tell the future and who knows where we're going to be but the fact that there are top two prospects right now minus nate pearson i know nate pearson's he's our not number a prospect one prospect anymore i never i never count him because he's on yeah. the big league team yeah, exactly <laughs> i mean vladdy's one of our top prospects too by that definition <laughs> like, right yeah that's right so if you look at groshans and martin they're both slated for third base. I, I know everyone hopes Martin is center field, but I mean, he hasn't played a lot of center field. We'll yeah. see how he does in double A or triple A or wherever he lands. But uh, who do you yeah. think gets called up first then, Groshans or Martin? I think Groshans will get called do you think up we'll first. We'll see either of them this year. I think it really will depend on how yeah. they perform. I mean, the truth is, is if Groshans at, is at triple A. And he is lighting the world mm-hmm. on fire. September, why wouldn't you call him up? Rosters yeah, no, expand, absolutely. going into the playoffs, give him a little sniff of the the MLB playoffs, uh, right? I, I maybe they call up Martin too. I mean, I don't know. The scouting report on Groshans is, man, can this kid hit? I yeah. feel like we've been saying about that about all of our prospects for the last three, four years now, but uh, you know. It is exciting stuff. So let's talk for a second here. Uh, Television broadcasting. Yes Network, the Yankees broadcast. And I mean, so Sportsnet wasn't even going to air any spring training games this year. You were going to literally need to get the MLB TV app to watch any of it. And so they changed that after everyone lost (laughs) their mind. And now they're they're broadcasting eleven of them, but they're not broadcasting them. They're airing rebroadcast. They're airing other feeds. So yesterday I was getting so frustrated. They just, they were interviewing Aaron Boone and I was like, they, they keep cutting away from Aaron Boone to, to show a ball game. This is so frustrating. <laughs> it's the same and with he, Luke Voigt. Oh my God. I'm like, why are they, why are they cutting away to Luke Voigt? Yeah. It's a ball game and we can hear him. <laughs> like just, just talk to him. Like, why do we need to see him and not Absolutely the game? Right. Yeah. <laughs> But Sportsnet made some weird choices the last week that I don't like. I'm an old radio guy, right? So I, I'm well aware of how the radio industry works, and it's always uh, be cheap, be cheap, cut at every turn you can. So the Toronto Blue Jays have been broadcast on radio since their inception in 77, and this year it is no longer going to be the case. They are cutting the radio broadcast. They're going to simulcast it. With okay, television. So what's that mean? Now, so that means they're going to take, and I love Dan Schulman and I love Buck Martinez. So they're going to take the audio from the television feed and they're going to air it on the radio. Not the same thing. This Not is insanity. Thing. This is insanity to me. Listen, I really enjoy listening to Buck Martinez meander around with his stories. You know, get to the point where everyone's like, what's he talking about? And then kind of get re- reeled back mm-hmm. in. You know, it is fun and it's baseball and there's a lot of time to fill. But when you're talking, listening to a baseball game on radio, did you ever listen to baseball on the radio? Um, much, the Adam? first time I did was, uh, I guess, during the 2015 playoff run because I was working and the playoff game right. aired at like fucking 3 p.m. So here yeah. the four plumbers would be <laughs> you know huddled around the work truck at uh, 3 p.m with a tool yeah. in our hand in case the boss showed up listening to the blue jays game there's something about it there's a little bit of there is a magic to it there's a romance to broadcasting baseball and the difference is like I'm, I'm like so I I built bikes back in the day, uh, pedal bikes, right? I was a piece worker, and I would just the I used to love afternoon ball games because I could just throw my headphones in my ear and just go to it, and just it 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 made the the work so much better, listening to a ball. So I'm just gonna give an example here of kind of how a baseball broadcast on the radio would go. Right, the batter digs into the batter's box, his left move. Left leg shifts. His bat is sitting on his shoulder. The pitcher looks in. 
The catcher waves off that. He goes in for the windup. You know, Detailed. like just and like, why do we want to? Why do we want to hear that on television? I, I absolutely do not. I'm like, I can see all of this, exactly. right? So there's a. It's trying to do both. I think it's just going to affect both sides. It's going to make both sides either either they're not going to care at all about radio, and they're just going to be like, you should be having that. You're like, that's what they're going to do. Yeah, I know. I know what you're saying though is that they're going to say, hey, Shulman and Buck, you know, try to be a try little, be more, a little more detailed, it, and that's yeah. That's yeah. not going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen at all. But you're right. I mean, I've listened to my yeah. fair share of hockey games on the radio, you know, just driving or whatever from Calgary to Edmonton, and you throw it on whatever AM station and listen to the crackled hockey game. And you could be listening to a whatever game between the Anaheim Ducks and the Chicago Blackhawks, and they call it like yeah. it's game seven of the Stanley Cup finals in mid November. Like they are so energized about, you know, yeah, and the pucks are all the more, and you're just like, it's magical. You f- you feel it, and that's yeah, that is the beauty of of the radio broadcast, and it's sad that it's over. It's sad. It's sad that they're killing it, and of course they're killing it in this roundabout way because of COVID. They say, which we all know right, is right. bullshit, but it's not it's like all there's money, more right? people it's all than money. ever at home listening and watching to stuff. So. Yeah. What's funny too is that, and I liked, I really do like Ben Wagner, and they're they're keeping him on the uh, television broadcast side of things. But I don't know, like, how much were they paying those guys? Like, what was it costing them to broadcast on the radio? Two hundred thousand yeah, dollars? It just seems a year. Yeah. It seems it just seems so yeah. weird to me. Maybe Marcus Simeon <laughs> could pitch in. <laughs> Yeah. All right, buddy, before we wrap this up, I do wish to give you a chance to, you were texting with me yesterday, or uh, sorry, last week, and it was just killing me. I was laughing so much. So some of you out there might not have seen it, and I'll let you take over yeah. here in a second, Adam. But there was a breakdown of Albert Pujols' stats at, next to Mike Trout's stats. And if you just wish to kind of go over those stats, Adam. Sure. So for those listening, I'll describe it. For anybody on the YouTube video, I'm going to throw it up on the, the screen here. But basically, it's a career comparison between Albert Pujols and Mike Trout uh, in their prime, quote-unquote. So this is comparing Mike Trout's entire career, 2011 to 2020, and Albert Pujols' Uh, from a similar sample size, 2001 to 2011. Obviously, being a few years older, right? So it's the first, like, 10 or so years in the league. Um, Then when you look down the list here, basically every stat is way more impressive for Albert Pujols. Uh, Batting average, 328 to 304. Home runs, 445 to 302. RBIs. 13.29 13.29 to 7.98. OPS is better. Wins above replacement is better, and so on. So, it's really framed like Poolholz is the right, superior. Player. We all can agree. Mike Trout is a phenomenal, like head and shoulders above the rest of the league kind of talent. Right? He is the example everyone uses when talking about the best in the game right now. Right. He's the LeBron, LeBron James, James. of baseball. Jordan, whatever, right? So, the GOAT, sort of, possibly, so arguably. It really hammers at home when you throw up, well, if you think Mike Trout has been great, well, look at how how much better Albert Pujols was in the first 10, 10 or so years of his career, right? And you're, The stats were eye-popping. I was shocked, actually, runs, when I saw Home runs, 302 for Mike Trout. 445 for Albert Pujols. RBIs mm-hmm. for Mike Trout. 798 1329 for Albert Pujols. It's absurd, right? Yeah. So, friend of the show Trevor Freeman sends me this little stat and we've kind of been going back and forth about the the long-term <laughs> contract that Albert Pujols signed in 2011. 10 years, 300 million dollars, right? Was it a bad contract? Was it a good contract or whatever? This is a contract, by the way, Albert Pujols is being paid $32 million this year. At 43 years old. (laughs) Supposedly Supposedly 43. 43. Yeah, we'll get into that, okay? So he's getting more money than, I don't know, Fernando Tatis Jr. is this year, to put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. 
Substantial. And you want to tell me that this contract is better. Okay, go eat your shorts, Trevor. Um, so he sends me this graphic, and he sends a one simple text message, I rest my case. As if this proves that this big contract was clearly worth it. And at first glance, it technically okay. did. Yes. But <laughs> here's what I said to Trevor. I said, yeah, between 2001 and 2011, he was an absolute savage. That's that's never been the argument in this contract that he just recently signed, okay? The fact is, the contract didn't pay him for those numbers. It paid him for the numbers he achieved after those numbers. So, yes, the first 10 years of his career, sorry, first 11 years of his career, 445 home runs, 1,329 RBIs, impressive. Very impressive. Amazing. Like even even there isn't think, a word to like really describe it. Then, like impressive isn't first enough. Ballot Hall of Fame yeah. for sure. Okay. Yeah. December 2011. So that's after all these stats have been achieved is when he signs his contract. 10-year contract. Since then, 217 home runs, 771 RBIs. That's meh. That's not that good. I mean, yeah. it's still good. Okay, it's not three. Yeah, it's still it's still above average, and it's still he's still going to be a first ballot half. Hall of Famer. We're not arguing pool holes as not a good player. No, by the not way, on this. not at all. We're just focused on. We the just feel this stat is being manipulated. Okay? Yes. So, two hundred and ten million dollars over nine years, with thirty million remaining for this last season. So who knows? He might have a monster season this year. But essentially, it's been 217 home runs, 771 RBIs for $210 million. That's 24 home runs, 85 RBI a year for nine years. That's what he's earned on this new contract. For an average of about $25 for about million, $25 a, year. million a year. So what I'm saying is, Fernando Tatis, if he hits those numbers, 25 home runs and 85 RBI a year for the next... For the huge next 10 overpay. years, there's huge no overpay. way you could say anything <laughs> other than that's a huge overpay. So to look backwards on Albert Pujols and say anything else about this last 10 years of contract, I mean, we, we, we can't credit those massive numbers from 2001 to 2011 and say, well, the, the contract that he signed after that was worth it. We can't. That's absurd. It's just absolutely absurd. And then what really got me worked up there's more to it though. There's even more to it, but yeah, keep going. <laughs> so I was texting you this on Wednesday. On Wednesdays, I pick my daughter up from school and I'm just, I have time on my hands, right? I'm sitting in the parking lot. I'm waiting for the, the bell to ring and I'm just going down a rabbit hole of how absurd these numbers are. <laughs> so first thing, like on first glance, you're like, okay, well, it's 10, 10 seasons each, right? When I'm looking at Albert Pujols and Mike Trout. But then when you look at it, it's actually 11 seasons for Albert Pujols and 10 seasons for Mike Trout. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, that's not, that's not really fair for giving Albert Pujols an extra season. So then I hop onto baseballreference.com and I'm like, well, how many games did they play? Right? Uh, between these 10 or so seasons. And the number was like shocking. It was like 500 extra games for Albert Pujols in this 2001 to 2011 chunk versus Mike Trout 2011 to 2020. And then I realize because Trout gets Trout's injury prone and it always has been. It's the only downfall in his but career. But on top of that, one of the 10 seasons that we're counting for Mike Trout is 2020. That's a 60 game season. So injuries are not, <laughs> that's a third of a season. 2011, yeah. the first season that we're counting for him was also his rookie season, which he got called up and played like 40 games. So we're not even comparing 11 seasons to 10. We're comparing 11 seasons to like eight and a half. Mm -hmm. Absurd. It is. It is. And again, this is not about Albert not Pujols. Being great. As, uh, He's great. Not this being is great. about stat manipulation just... and trying to trick us into thinking something that like you don't need to trick us about. Yeah. We're not talking about Trev either. No, no, no. This, this is just like this baseball. Is MLB like, yeah, this is just official graphic that was yeah, put out. Is, like, oh, look how amazing. Yeah, this is what statisticians do. They do. Yeah. So stats lie. So just keep that in mind, I guess, is the point. Um, one other detail. Mike Trout entered the MLB 19 years old. 
Okay, so a kid, essentially a kid. Albert Pujols' first season was 21 years old. Okay, so he's already two years older. And that's that's if we try and convince ourselves that he is actually the age that he claims to be. I mean, I'm not going to be the first one to speculate that a player from the Dominican... A Dominican back, back in, in the, the 90s late 90s. Age. I mean, we have <laughs> hundreds of examples of Major League Baseball players from the Dominican who lied about their age for various reasons. I mean, Miguel Tejada was famously exposed in the middle of a yeah. ESPN piece, um, but has admitted to it. Bartolo Colon has admitted to it. Um, I believe Vlad Sr. Which is hilarious, because Bartolo Colon, it doesn't even matter. The man just, well, it, he, he, it, he was no, ageless. I mean, <laughs> but, but the point is, is that, you know, I mean speculation yeah. we can't confirm that albert pujols was two years older than he claimed to be but there is a non-zero chance that he was so there's yeah we're potentially comparing eight and a half seasons of mike trout from the age 19 to you know 27 versus albert pujols from 23 to 34 like that is a I can't even. Yeah. I can't even explain how absurd. It's those a terrible comparison. Are. It's a terrible so comparison. What 100%. I did was I actually went and said, "Let's uh, let's just look at a a fair comparison size, right? So let's look at Mike Trout from the age twenty three to his most recent full season. We're going to erase twenty twenty because that doesn't count. Okay, so twenty five to twenty eight, or sorry, twenty three to twenty eight, and we look at Albert Pujols in that same age range." The numbers get a lot more comparable. Um, mm-hmm. It ended up being like, uh, I think on average, 40 home runs a season for uh, Albert Pujols in that 23 to 28 range and like 37 yeah. for Mike Trout. So, right. and that was even more frustrating because if we just. It's still it's incredible still that incredible. Pujols is. His numbers were still better. I mean, just in those categories, but we don't need to give one guy 500 extra games and pretend that we're comparing apples to apples here. We're not. Yeah. And it's just so frustrating because it makes me feel like they think I'm an idiot. Yeah. Stat manipulation, man. It happens in every sport and it is a very frustrating thing to watch. Not even just in sports. It happens in politics. It happens everywhere. And it's so infuriating because especially at a passing glance, like these stats are Mm -hmm. staggering, but they didn't need to be. I mean, a hundred percent, man, a hundred percent. And that's the thing is that it was, it's staggering even to think the pool holes outdid trout in their prime in certain categories. Anyways, that's a stat that I would love to see. I don't know why you need to put some extra mustard on it and kind of, you know, but Anyways, man, thanks so much for going into that. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening. I think we'll wrap her up here. Right, bud? Did no, you have anything you wanted to add? after that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, Nick Elgayer, lefty with the Blue Jays, is going to uh, – his interview is going to be released on Wednesday on YouTube. You can – Subscribe to our channel. I would be greatly appreciated. If you do enjoy the podcast, please go ahead and rate and comment and all Tell that good stuff. Tell a friend. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to The Walk-Off, everybody. Take care. Cheers.